I'm Ari Redford, and this is TRM Talks. I am Global Head of Policy at TRM Labs. At TRM, we provide blockchain intelligence software to support law enforcement investigations and to help financial institutions and cryptocurrency businesses mitigate financial crime risk within the emerging digital asset economy. Prior to joining TRM, I spent 15 years in the U.S. federal government, first as a prosecutor at the Department of Justice, and then as a Treasury Department official, where I worked to safeguard the financial system against terrorist financiers, weapons of mass destruction proliferators, drug kingpins, and other rogue actors. On TRM Talks, I sit down with business leaders, policymakers, investigators, and friends from across the crypto ecosystem who are working to build a safer financial system. Today, we're going to be talking to Jared Koopman, Executive Director, Cyber and Forensic Services for IRS Criminal Investigations. But first, Inside the Lab, where I share data-driven insights from our blockchain intelligence team. Recently, our policy team wrote a piece on the U.S. Treasury and the work it has been doing in the crypto regulatory enforcement space. There are so many aspects to what the department does. My focus has always been on the illicit finance and national security piece. That piece is overseen by the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. At the end of 2023, the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Treasury gave a speech to crypto industry leaders on the steps Treasury has taken to, quote, prevent bad actors from using the digital asset ecosystem for illicit activity. The speech laid out Treasury's crypto-related illicit finance playbook target the illicit parts of the crypto ecosystem with sanctions, and use enforcement actions to send a message about the need for compliance. One day prior to that speech, the Deputy Secretary sent a letter to Congress asking for additional authorities. Beyond the speech and the letter, to end the year we saw a flurry of activity coming out of Treasury, from sanctions to proposed rulemakings, enforcement actions to historic settlements. While all of this feels like a whirlwind of activity, If you slow down a moment, you can see key themes developing. The first is Treasury continues to be concerned with mixers. Over the years, we've seen Treasury target mixers like Tornado Cash, Chip Mixer, Blender.io with sanctions, and other types of actions. Treasury remains very, very concerned about the ability to obfuscate the flow of funds using this type of technology. So concerned that on October 19th, FinCEN, the Financial Intelligence Unit of the U.S. Treasury Department, proposed a rule that would require U.S. financial institutions, including crypto businesses, to monitor and report on transactions involving cryptocurrency mixers. Treasury also continues to target illicit actors with sanctions. Over the last few years, we've seen Treasury go after Suex, Chadex, Garantex, and most recently Bycash, all non-compliant cryptocurrency exchanges for not having the controls in place for allowing sanctions and ransomware and other types of illicit activity to flow through. So Treasury for years has been focused on, hey, on the one hand, let's go after the illicit actors, what Todd Conklin called on TRM Talks a few years ago, the illicit underbelly of the crypto ecosystem, while hoping to allow lawful users to continue to grow. Treasury is also thinking about decentralized finance. We saw a report recently from the CFTC on the topic Just last year in April, we saw a risk assessment from the U.S. Treasury, which most notably opines that DeFi activities could fall under the Bank Secrecy Act. And finally, Treasury continues to send a message about compliance. And it's not just Binance, the Binance settlement. It's many other BitPay and Bitco and Bittrex and Kraken, all having done settlements with the U.S. Treasury on sanctions exposure and weak AML controls. Again, Treasury using enforcement actions to send a message to the broader community. We have written a lot on these actions, so for much, much more on how Treasury has used its authorities in crypto, check out our insights page at trmlabs.com. All right, now let's sit down with Jared Koopman of IRS Criminal Investigations. Jared, this is something I have been wanting to do for a while. So thank you for making it happen and really excited to uh, have a conversation with you today. Yeah, of course. Me as well. Before we delve into CI, we'd love to talk about you, kind of hear a little bit about your journey to the space and to your role as an agent, to your role as a, a leader within CI and really sort of the broader crypto investigations community. So yeah, I started my career very young. Actually, I'm uh, 
lifelong government employee. I was one of those student intern co-ops that came right out of college. So it was, uh, this is all I've ever known. My actual background in college was in accounting, which is pretty obvious for an IRS agent, but I also minored in computer information systems, which kind of dovetails into what I'm doing today. It really sparked my interest in this space to begin with. Graduating from a, a small school in upstate New York, like I said, I joined IRS CI very early, 22 years old. I was a special agent working cases and could never imagine that where I'd be 20 years later, 22, 23 years later in my career. I took a path of, of working cases, which were traditional financial fraud cases. And, and then over uh, a period of about eight to 10 years, I had the interest to get into management. So I ended up taking over one of the upstate New York PODs or offices there where I was overseeing a smaller group. And then I was uh, selected as one of four to uh, start on like an accelerated leadership path. So I was an analyst in DC. Then I went to be a, an assistant special agent in charge in, in Chicago. And then I was a special agent in charge in Detroit. And then eventually took over this role. And uh, Chicago was actually the, the place where it really fell back in love and really started to get more involved with the, the crypto space. It was more of a timing and a happenstance. I was actually in Chicago as the ASAC or assistant special agent in charge, overseeing four groups there, one of them being the South Bend, Indiana host of duty. And we had an astute agent by the name of Chris Janczewski <laughs> who worked out of that office. And this was a very new young agent at the time. And for those that aren't aware, Chris is uh, obviously now a, a TRM employee and has been doing phenomenal work both for the government and TRM over the years. Chris and I became friends and you know he had called one day saying that he was interested in thinking about looking into this Bitcoin stuff and what it was actually doing in the finance space and kind of piqued my interest as well. And together we kind of both started interacting with Bitcoin very early. This is 2013, 14. We opened wallets. We were purchasing Bitcoin at forty dollars a coin, which you know, if I was omniscient, I would have certainly held that on <laughs> to sixty thousand, and we would be having a different discussion this <laughs> this, uh, this afternoon. <laughs> but that's really what sparked my interest. It was kind of a joint effort, and that kind of led to several things. I love that so much. Honestly, I consider you both friends, and I'm not sure I knew that piece of the puzzle. That that's really cool. I want to back you up on the sort of leadership thing for a moment. You know, we have a lot of folks on the show who I can say of leaders and builders in the crypto space and within law enforcement and policy. There are different roads that take people to sort of leadership. Talk a little bit about that. Being an agent, you kind of have this uh, mission drive. I was one of those agents that always said, I'm never getting into management. I just want to work great cases, be part of that like great team. And I was coming off of uh, several large cases that I had worked, financial fraud cases that took me to trial, long trials. I had five trials go back to back for several years. And to be frank, it was kind of a great transition period for me. I finished those cases. We had a, a supervisor move out of the role and I said, okay, I'll, I'll sit in the chair for a few months and just help out. And it'd be a good break from all these cases. But then sitting there, I had this really great opportunity to help others and help the agents that were working their cases and actually impart some of the knowledge that I had built over the, the decade of working some of these great cases. So it was much more satisfying than I had ever imagined it to be. And, you know, I have a family, a couple of kids that were very young at the time. And to be able to pick up and move away from everything we've ever known was certainly daunting, but it was, it was also the greatest experience of our, our lives that really made the kids more resilient and made us more resilient, much more open-minded to a lot of other things that were occurring. I don't think a lot of people realize, you know, how much movement there is within U.S. federal law enforcement, whether it's you're going to headquarters for a stint or you're going to a field office somewhere. It's like a sports draft, right? They send you where they want to send you and you got to play for that team. Let's talk a little bit about CI wing. I think there's this perception out there that, you know, IRS immediately tax collection revenue, which is all true, but you're investigating cases that may or may not have a tax nexus, certainly have a financial crime nexus and are much, much bigger. It's an agency that's really punching way above its weight. We certainly have that mandate that we are the only agency that can handle tax fraud. So, I mean, we have expectations that that has to be a big part of our, our work. That being said, probably about 60% of it falls in that category. 
The other 40% of the work we do is all financial related. We are the only agency that completely dedicates 100% of our time to financial fraud investigations. I always tell everyone, you know, if money's involved, we can be involved. And other than crimes of passion, money's usually behind everything. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, look, going back to, you know, the early days of law enforcement, right, the FBI's pursuit of Al Capone and others, a lot of it was around the financial crime piece, the tax piece. Going, Chris Jancheski, who you referenced, I was talking to him the other day sort of about this topic. He's got this joke about like this guy wearing a pocket protector and carrying a gun. Yeah, a lot of folks don't even know this. We are the law enforcement arm of Treasury and then also of IRS because we fall under that larger Treasury umbrella. You mentioned punching above our weight. I mean, we are 2,000, maybe 2,200 agents around the country and globally with another thousand professional staff and management staff. But that's not very many when you start thinking about the likes of FBI and some of these larger agencies that have tens of thousands. But we certainly think we do a very niche job of focusing on financial fraud. You mentioned your relationship with Chris early on. Would you talk a little bit about the genesis of that? Sort of how did we get to this little agency with 2,000 strong, punching above its weight, to really leading global law enforcement when it comes to cryptocurrency-related investigations? It was an interesting time. This is going back again to about that 2014-15 timeframe. Digital assets, cryptocurrency, it was a very easy transition for us to start getting involved in because it was the same stuff we've been doing, same types of crimes, just now involving crypto or digital assets. But then there was also this this grassroots buildup. We had this team that was kind of uh, put in DC to work cases that were just starting to pop up in this area. We felt we had a strong case for why digital assets or crypto was going to be this involvement in the future wave of economy. And we kind of dedicated some effort towards that. So they had brought me in, this was in 2015, 16, to stand up a cyber crimes division and lead that from policy, funding, oversight, personnel, training. And that was a daunting task, but it was something that was very much needed at, at that time. But we had also established these cyber crimes units, one in, in DC and one in LA. And the one in DC was the one where Chris actually worked out of. And that team was was just rock stars. I mean, we were able to pluck you know, some of the best agents from the field that had a propensity for just challenging their mind to this new wave of cryptocurrency and digital assets. And you start putting like-minded folks into a room and giving them resources and the ability to really run and innovate. We really started cooking with, with fire. I mean, it was everybody was excited about it. And this was the heydays of... Gary Alford making attribution on Silk Road to Jeremy Haney working the very first digital case with Liberty Reserve. I mean, we were setting precedents for cases that we had never even, you know, there was nothing in the books on this. You know, we were kind of making things up as we went along. I do think we'll look back on this period, that period you're talking about, 2015 to 2020 or so, as this sort of golden age where we learned how to do cryptocurrency related investigations and IRSCI was really out front. I did the show very recently with Chris, who you mentioned, and Andy Greenberg, who wrote the book Tracers in the Dark. And I think at one point I said something to Andy is like, I'm pretty sure you wrote a book on the golden age of crypto investigations when we kind of look back on that period. And you just named it, right? Chris and Tigran and Jeremy and, you know, all these folks doing this extraordinary work. <laughs> and then a lot of them were at CI or most all of them were at CI, which is just pretty wild. Yeah, it really was. I couple it with a few things. I mean, it made sense because we were the financial folks. So who else were you giving it to? We were the only ones that had a team kind of set up to start addressing this financial area. And then we were also very much dialed into the innovation in the space. So we were talking with folks that are very well established now in private entities and companies that were crypto pioneers. You know, they were setting up companies. They were helping with blockchain analytics. They were doing a lot of stuff on the forefront. And we said, we need to be dialed into them because they are industry experts. We're coming at it from a government. And then we also try to dial in with academia and say, hey, teach us. Like, We need to know about this and we need to develop it like yesterday because the criminals are you know, starting to use it. One thing that I remember during that time, I was a prosecutor and I noticed more interagency, more inner law enforcement collaboration in these types of cases than really in any other cases that were going on. You know, the sort of TV turf war style 
stuff that everyone watches, it is real to some extent, but I wasn't ever seeing it in these cases. I think that's always been a focus for you personally as well, is just ensuring that you're working with officials at FBI, Homeland Security, Secret Service, DEA, who bring that different expertise to the table. No, it's a great point. There always is some of that with general fraud cases. I mean, you always want to have your agency's name attached to the next largest case, right? This really changed the landscape, though, both from interagency cooperation, but also foreign jurisdictional cooperation. Never before in my career had I seen like that connection, that collaboration happening so vastly. I mean, we had other countries, we had all of these law enforcement agencies domestically, whether it was HSI, Secret Service, FBI, everybody bringing kind of their strengths to the table because we realized that it, it couldn't be done by one group. What one group brought in technical capabilities, another group had something else. You know, it was like relying on FBI for some of their networking and intrusion capabilities to then us just staying in our lane of financial tracing. So all of that, I think, was a really well-timed marriage. And, and even to this day, I see you know, more collaboration here than, than pretty much any other time in my, my past career. If you look at the big cases over the last several years, terror financing, DPRK, welcome to video, which we'll talk about in a moment, all massive interagency collaboration, oftentimes led by IRSCI. What are the cases that really stand out for you when you're thinking about that special group? I mean, you can't have that conversation without welcome to video just because of the, the magnitude of it. When I do presentations, I have this one PowerPoint slide that actually highlights several cases as being the first of their kind. Like they've never been done before, whether it's the first crypto kiosk that we work with Kunal Kalra to the first Bitcoin mixers. You know, we did Helix and Bitcoin Fog, two cases that CI worked predominantly. So you mentioned DPRK and the North Korean hacks. Those were the first kind of crypto related national security kind of involvements with national state actors to some of the largest investment fraud cases. I mean, we had OneCoin, BitConnect, BitClub Network. I mean, these are billion dollar schemes. Maybe within the last six or eight months, I was trying to do a presentation and make a point. And I want to say, like, I added up all the money that IRSCI has seized in crypto investigations and compared them to the GDP of, like, countries in the world. And, like, IRSCI is a pretty big country yeah. um, based on based on those numbers. I mean, it's pretty wild to see. And it's the nature of cryptocurrency that sort of you can move more funds faster than ever before means that seizures are historic. Our total somewhere in the aggregated amount of around $11 billion in value. But you're looking at cases like Zong that certainly has had a ton of press and, and media attention with three plus billion in proceeds from Silk Road thefts back in the day to Bitfinex hack where we had colorful characters out of New York that were also, you know, billions of dollars. But then we also think about the, the global impact, certainly a dark web and kind of the activities that occur there with marketplaces and vendors still doing pretty much everything and anything illegal remains a focus for all of law enforcement. So when we when we're able to really take down, you know, the Silk Roads, the Alpha Bays, the Hydras of the world yeah. and help support our foreign counterparts in doing that, that has much more of a global stance to really solidify and help the mission of, of protecting global economy. It seems to me that regulators and law enforcement are part of this effort are trying to figure out how do we enable lawful users of this new technology a certain degree of privacy in a more open financial system, but at the same time ensuring that illicit actors are not using mixers at scale. And there are differences, right, between a mixer that is lawful and illicit use or mixers like Bitcoin Fog and Helix were essentially advertised to evade law enforcement, right? How do you think about this? You're quite frankly one of the most thoughtful people I know in law enforcement and just would love kind of your take on, on what your role is. Personally and my team within CI, we, we sit in on a lot of task forces and a lot of like uh, advisory groups that are trying to help push forward some of the information just from a criminal standpoint on how it's being used and how we really need to stop it. And it really does, it comes down to having the visibility into the transactions at a surface level, making sure that transactions aren't being used for something illegal like the, the magnitude of cases I just rattled off, but allowing the privacy by the individuals to be able to really afford 
you know, what the technology was built for. I mean, the technology was built for that capability to be fast, you know, to be transparent with the decentralized aspect, but then also afford that pseudo anonymous capability where you have privacy that people don't know what you're doing with your finances. And that's all good. I think it just creates an environment that is ripe for fraud if it's not controlled at the guide rails. And that's the financial systems, the traditional banking, the exchangers. They all need to be cognizant that there's much more than just money to be made and movement of transactions. You know, it's real people behind cases like Welcome to Video that need to be protected. Any sort of thing that you're seeing right now that is particularly either a really good development that you see in the space or something that concerns you? Yeah, I think um, Web3 has really started to change the landscape when we start talking about tokens and the capability to really drive that market. You know, there's a lot there. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, whether it's the capability to really have much more of a reach into finances and transactions, like offering tokens behind real estate transactions or other investment type components or business transactions. That capability is there, but whenever you start incorporating smart contracts and things behind the technology that make it a little bit more complicated, there's always going to be a a criminal lurking trying to take advantage of those that maybe not as sophisticated in the space or are trying to really just pull a quick one over on someone. So Web3 has changed the landscape. I'm also, one thing that I'm cognizant of is the gaming industry um, is certainly one that we're focused on, you know, whether you're talking metaverse or just general gaming and incorporating that with traditional finance. So now you have the capability to move from digital assets to finance within gaming platforms with secure channels for chat and and communications creates a lot of vulnerabilities within those systems. So I think it's the landscape's going to continue to change and it's a, you know, it's really upon us to highlight it, work with industry, work with regulators to really hopefully put some framework around it that that will protect everyone at, at large. I mentioned kind of that golden age, and maybe we're still in that, right? There's still a cadre of of agents and investigators out there that are that are the ones who are primarily doing this work. We know them all essentially today. Are we moving from that to a world in which everyone needs to understand blockchain intelligence, investigate crypto in their cases? Like I keep saying it's gonna happen. I don't think we're quite there yet, but I do think we're kind of getting there. We're like you know, there's a blockchain analytics tool on everyone's desktop because like, hey, crypto's cash, right? That's what people transact in. Do you see us heading in that direction? I do see it being a complement and a supplement to all of the other finances. Will it ever be like the end all and control? I don't think so. But I do think it's going to be interwoven to a lot of our traditional just interaction because now everything's on a phone, it's on apps or alternative payment systems that are now integrated with digital assets. And it's funny, you mentioned, I was smirking a little bit, you mentioned about like, we're gonna see a lot more of the population become much more already involved with this. Over this, you know, last week or two over the holidays, I actually sat and had my 18 year old daughter taking a crypto class. So she actually was running through crypto basics, crypto 101 and several of the token NFTs and learning some of this stuff because I said, you need to understand this. And if you're interested in kind of finance, which she is in more of her college pursuit, this will be a part of it. That is so cool and not surprising knowing you. Open invitation to TRM Academy anytime your daughter wants to come in and take some classes for sure. One of the critiques that I've heard from folks like yourself and Chris Janczewski and others who are sort of the experts within the agency, and this is true at FBI and and, and elsewhere as well, is that agents in the field all the time are calling and saying, hey, there's this address in my case. Do we get to a point where each of those agents in the field doing whatever they're doing are going to be needing blockchain tracing capability? Yeah, I know from our standpoint, being that, you know, this is primarily what we do, financial tracing. I mean, we are outfitting almost our entire workforce to have the capabilities with blockchain analytics to have access to, as a whole agency, to take trainings on crypto from crypto 101 to certifications to advanced trainings, we feel like every agent has to have an understanding of this space. And this is kind of like most agents until it's right in front of their face and they need it, then they'll actually go out and search for it and find it and teach themselves. But we do have a lot of agents that are taking that initiative on themselves. And 
And then on top of that, our attrition over the last several years has been tremendous. And we're now at a stage where we're hiring back some of those vacant spots. We're getting a lot of folks in that have backgrounds in digital assets and cryptocurrency. They've previously worked for an exchange. They worked at a bank doing AML and their crypto compliance. And I was you know, shocked to hear some of this because the space is still pretty new, but we're seeing some of those come through and it's, it's really uh, fun to see. What advice do you give to folks, right? Like I hear all the time, like people wanting essentially to be Jared Koopman, to be Chris Jenczewski, to really understand this tech, but also kind of lead in the space. What advice do you give to a young investigator who's maybe applying to CI or looking to get into this space? I think, uh, you know, the more you educate yourself in this space, you start to become that one, two percent of the population that understands the technology, understands how to do blockchain analytics, how to look for things that are anomalies in this space. That puts you in a very small category. And then other than that, it's becoming patient. It's becoming persistent, but then also have that growth mindset. I, I speak a lot of this with my kids. It's like, you don't want to just suck. You don't just sit back. Like you should always be growing, whether it's physically, mentally, you know, whatever your interests are, you need to be constantly pursuing things to keep your mind sharp. And I think that's something that a lot of people fail to do. They get into jobs, they get into roles and they just, they look at it as a, a linear static kind of uh, position. One thing I've preached for most of my leadership career is like innovate. Think outside the box. Like I'm going to help you push the envelope. And we always talk about in our office, breaking glass, like break glass, wherever that ceiling is, like it's not there. Let's do something new. I love that. To that end, you do one thing that I have always really admired. I want to ask you about it. A, the presenting style. It's very, like, honestly, like our conversation today, very organic, conversational, but still ensuring that you stay on point, that you're focused. We had our TRM Leo Summit recently, where we had 300 law enforcement agents from across the interagency, FBI, HSI, IRS, CI, DEA, Secret Service. And you spoke there. And what you did was you actually took what other folks had said who had gone before you from those other agencies, and you sort of put it together with your own remarks, which I actually thought was something you don't see very often, particularly from law enforcement folks. You don't want to break a ceiling. Accountant, investigator, agents are not public speakers, right? That's not something that sort of comes with the territory. How did you, how have you developed this sort of unique thing? I think being well-rounded helps. So uh, it goes back to that growth mindset. Like if you can fit into many circumstances, you have the ability to talk the talk and walk the walk in a lot of different areas. And I think it, it goes to pushing yourself and just trying new things, you know, developing new things. And I think when you have that ability, you get more comfortable in situations where you have to speak on it. I'll tell you, I'll be very uncomfortable presenting or talking on something that I don't know anything about. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. <laughs> what, right? Yeah. Most people are going to feel that way. But if you're wanting to speak on a topic that you can at least say you have familiarity with, that you're comfortable with, well, that can take you a lot of spaces the, the more you're developed. But I think it's funny. I think I may have mentioned this to you because after that speech, you mentioned that. And I kind of replay in my mind Eminem in the movie Eight Mile. <laughs> totally. I, always loved, I always loved the end of that movie <laughs> as even when it first came out, because, you know, he's got nowhere to go. He's getting crushed at the end. They mentioned, like, are you afraid they're going to bring up everything they did to you? And uh, he says, you know, what? I'm going to come out with everything before they do as a recap <laughs> and then and then kind of throw it back. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, I don't even I don't think you said that. I don't think you gave me the analogy there, but but uh, oh, I love that so much. When people ask me this question, it's it's funny because I can do the M&M thing, too. And that is I'm always nervous, I think, in a good way. And I, I speak publicly a lot. I do crazy, you know, news shows and, you know, haven't seen a question, but I'm nervous because I care. Right. And I think that people ask all the time. It's like, are you nervous? I'm like, absolutely. And it's like the mom spaghetti line from from that song. It's like, yeah, I always feel like I got to go, you know, <laughs> throw <out> mom <laughs> spaghetti or whatever before getting on there. But then you do it and you care and you, you know, you make it happen or whatever. And it's really about just being authentic. You can almost see through people when they're, they have things that are just scripted and it's just coming across as a drafted thing that they're just reading. I think it, it, it comes a little bit better when you're speaking on a topic, again, that you're comfortable and familiar with, but it's coming from a place that you're just responding. I have loved this conversation because it feels exactly that. Last question as we roll into 2024, 
What are you most excited about from Jared Koopman's perspective personally and then from CI's perspective? Personally, I think, um, you know, we're at critical years with our kids, which I mentioned. So seeing it go off into their new progress, uh, helping them through that. They're big into sports. So what are we playing? A little basketball and a lot of soccer. And then, like I mentioned, growth mindset. You got to have your own personal goals. I'm actually big into martial arts. I own a martial arts gym. I'm a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. So I have a a couple of gyms that I oversee and teach morning classes at. That helps you continue to kind of have that mindset of humbling and there's always more to learn. So I think uh, making some goals in that space will be a big aspect for me. But then certainly professionally, we have a lot of great things going on. I mean, we have a new facility being built in Virginia with the ACDC, the Advanced Collaboration and Data Center. And that will really be a, a new innovative hub for us. And I think it's something that we're all excited about. And then certainly I've mentioned some areas that we are diving into from an investigative standpoint, and I'm excited to see what type of innovation we have to combat the criminals. I know I promised last question, but the martial arts thing, I think the the people are going to demand answers. I think that's a great example of sort of like that discipline, right, that you probably bring to so many aspects of your life. Talk about that journey a little bit, if you don't mind. My wife teases me because I have more hobbies than probably most people in a lifetime. But I find it interesting when I don't know things, especially these rabbit holes of areas that you can spend a lifetime and still not have. I mean, this plays so much of the crypto piece too, right? right? Yeah, 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 exactly. hundred percent. I got out of college. I played lacrosse in college. I played professionally for a little while for an indoor lacrosse team in, in upstate New York. And when I got done with that, I think physically I had this void of like, what do I do now? And then starting my career, I was looking for kind of a martial art to get involved in. And Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was still at the early stages, but I found the practicality of it to be very, very important for law enforcement. So I started that journey and it was a long journey of probably 15 years before I actually got my black belt, moving from different cities, training all over the world. That kind of carries into everything else you do. I always call them rabbit holes because you go down one and you see 10 others that you didn't even know existed. And it doesn't matter what you talk about. There's always depth to the complexity of things that you that you want to get involved in. Beyond the sort of physical skills, what are you teaching your students? Mental toughness is one. A lot of folks that join, they could be looking for just losing weight to protecting themselves. And it's the mental aptitude and toughness to be able to to kind of go past where you thought was a barrier. So again, breaking glass, right? And and being able to to think about more of a strategic standpoint. We call it chess match on on the mats. You have to know what the other person's trying to do to combat it. And it's kind of a that's kind of a, a dance in life, right? It's like you know it applies to most things, and and then just having fun. We really try to build a culture that's built around fun and not. Anytime you create something that's uh, that's not enjoyable, people aren't going to be <laughs> be interested, right? That's awesome. Jared Koopman, IRSCI, thank you so much for joining TRM Talks. I have learned a lot, including your black belt <laughs> status. We do the TRM Running Club. Running's my sort of mental health, and I run marathons and talk all the time about how it's only in part physical, but really so much sort of mental. But yeah, that's mostly because I don't like to, you know, travel around the world getting my butt kicked. I just <laughs> feel like, you know, running is, 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 is about all I need. But yeah, really, thanks so much for joining TRM Talks. Of course. My pleasure. It's so perfect to have Jared right after Andy Greenberg and Chris Chancheski because Andy tells the story of the key crypto cases in Tracers in the Dark. And Chris, who was one of the lead investigators or the lead investigator on almost every one of those cases, every crime is a financial crime. And IRSCI has a team of gun-carrying accountants who are some of the best investigators in the world when it comes to fraud and financial crime. I think the other thing that's always sort of struck me, and this was definitely true when I was a prosecutor, is that crypto investigations are different. You hear about these TV-style turf wars between different agencies. And those certainly exist, but not as much in crypto. And I think it's because of this sort of small cadre of investigators who are power users of these types of tools. If you look at the Department of Justice press releases over the last several years, you see IRSCI, you see FBI, 
you often see Secret Service all working hand in hand. This move that we're starting to see where the expertise exists really across all of IRS criminal investigations and the interagency on crypto investigations matters because you want every law enforcement officer to have the tools and the training. But more importantly, we need to keep this ecosystem safe. We've written a lot about hacks and exploits and and fraud and pig butchering and other types of financial crime at TRM. And you may care about those exploits because you care deeply about national security like I do. You want to stop North Korea. You want to stop terrorist financing. You want to ensure that victims are able to get some of their funds back. We are highly motivated, obviously, at TRM to do all of those things. But if you just love this ecosystem, if you want crypto to grow and thrive and continue to onboard users and build this ecosystem, we can't have $9.4 billion in fraud like we had in 2022. We can't have North Korea attacking DeFi protocols at unprecedented speed and scale, stealing hundreds of millions of dollars. If this ecosystem is going to grow and thrive, we have to stop bad actors. And one of the ways to do that is ensure that every law enforcement entity has the tools that they need to help build a safer financial system. Next on TRM Talks, I am joined by threat intelligence expert, Jessica Davis. Thanks to all of you for joining TRM Talks today and for helping us build a safer financial system. If you love the show, leave a review wherever you're listening to it. For more crypto insights, you can also subscribe to the TRM Weekly Roundup at trmlabs.com. TRM Talks is brought to you by TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. This episode was produced in partnership with Voltage Productions. The music for this show was provided by Ecolix. Now, let's get back to building.